Okay, in this lecture we're going to be talking about something that we've been using um, thus far without really formalizing it or thinking too much about it um, or focusing too much on it, um, call something called feature expansion. So in this lecture we're going to look more deeply at what these uh, feature expansions are and how we can uh, use them to define something called a kernel, which is a, a general purpose technique that's um, very useful for regression, uh, classification, and so on. So we'll first discuss kernels a bit in the abstract and then see some examples of how they can be used. So a feature expansion, um, also called a basis expansion, we'll say feature expansions, are something we've done before in this uh, course without uh, talking too much about them. Um, the idea or the motivation is where a linear model in the original feature space uh, doesn't work for some reason. So if our data is in, uh, is in RD and we want to do either a linear uh, regression model or a linear classifier, um, doing a linear model in RD is not going to work because of the way that the data is structured. And so the solution is to take each data point and map it to a higher dimension and then do a linear model in that higher dimension. So we're going to now um, formalize this a bit uh, more and say that the mapping function is phi. So this function phi takes in a vector x in r little d and maps it to a higher dimensional space r capital D. Um, it doesn't have to be r capital D. It could be some subset of r capital D, but we'll just say r capital D. Uh, where d is greater, uh, big D is greater than little d. And then once we embed each point in that higher dimensional space, we're going to do our linear model uh, there. So for example, we already saw how um, with polynomial regression on r, so the original dimensionality of the data is 1, we can do um, uh, p uh, polynomial regression uh, using uh, using a feature expansion into RP where we map the one-dimensional X into a p-dimensional space like this. So in that case, the mapping of X is from R1 to RP where the dimensions are simply the, the square, the cube, up to the p uh, power of X. Uh, another example, we didn't really discuss it, but it's just as legitimate, would be to take our one-dimensional uh, value for x and map it to R2 where the first dimension is x and the second dimension might be an indicator of x being less than some number a. Imagine we know that there's some sort of a jump discontinuity that occurs at a. The second dimension would then take care of that with a linear model. So the motivation for this is that even though things don't look linear in the original space, in this higher dimension, higher dimensional space that we map to uh, things do suddenly start to look linear. Um, so let's, or, or a linear model can suddenly uh, become useful. So let's look at an example for regression and then we'll see a classification example next. So this is a toy problem. We uh, want to do regression, uh, a linear regression model for this uh, left uh, data set where we have the input is uh, x, the response is y, and so we plot the x, y pair like this. So x is in R. Uh, clearly the data doesn't really suit, uh, look like it's uh, suitable for a linear model because if we did a uh, line through this we would get something like this with least squares which wouldn't take account the f uh, into account the fact that there's this sort of uh, undulation in the data. So this the original space. Now we take the data from the original space and we map it to R2 where we use this mapping. So we take X and we map it from R1 to R2 where the first dimension remains X but then the second dimension is the cosine of X. So now this is our two-dimensional input and we want to do a linear model there. So we see now that we have a two-dimensional input space and again a one-dimensional response space and this is the type of a mapping that we have. And now, 
if we want to do a linear model in this two-dimensional space, what that amounts to is learning three coefficients, uh, uh, w naught, which is the offset, w1, which is the weight for x, and then w2, which is the weight for the cosine of x. And now if we plot the uh, decision, the uh, prediction, the regression you know, uh, function uh, in the higher dimensional space, we get something that looks like this. So we get a plane cutting through the data. So what this is meant to show is that this data, perhaps it's not clear from looking at this, but from this data, is all it lies perfectly on this on this plane, in uh, two-dimensional plane, and then if we go back to the original space and see what does the prediction look like, what does this two-dimensional input, uh, what this two-dimensional input makes a prediction for each value of x, we can show it in the two dimensions as a plane, or we can go back and show that same prediction just as a function of the in original x, and we get a decision that looks like this. So we've done linear regression uh, in a higher dimensional space. When we come back down to the original space in R1, we get something that looks like this. So it's nonlinear. It looks nonlinear in the original space, but it's, that's because it's linear in a higher dimensional space. So here's a, th another example where we want to do classification. So imagine that we have uh, data that's uh, inputs are two-dimensional. So this is an input x, and then the label is binary, so it's a 0, 1 classification problem. Uh, let's say that blue is, is 1, red is 0. So all of these are labeled 0, whereas all of these points in the outer circle are labeled 1. If we wanted to do a linear classifier in this space, what that amounts to is trying to find some line that cuts through the two classes, which of course is impossible, as we can see. However, if we take the original two-dimensional data and map it up to three dimensions using this function, where we take, so for a particular uh, two-dimensional vector x, we map, uh, we map the first dimension to be the first dimension of x squared. The third dimension is the second dimension of x squared, and then the second dimension in this mapped space is the product of the two dimensions of the vector x. So we take a two-dimensional x, we project it into a three-dimensional space using this projection rule, and then we plot what does the data look like now in R3 instead of R2, and so we get something like this. So we see that in this projection space, now suddenly we can come up with a, we can define a hyperplane, a two-dimensional hyperplane in this space that's going to cut through the two classes. So here we do a linear classifier where we declare the sign of x to be, uh, we declare the, the label of x to be the sign of the function w naught, which is the offset, plus the dot product between this mapped uh, feature and some coefficient vector w, which, uh, which expanded looks like this. So now we want to learn four, uh, four weights, w0 through w3. Three of those weights are going to interact with the projected data. And those, as we've discussed, this uh, three-dimensional vector w is going to define a two-dimensional hyperplane in R3. w0 will shift that hyperplane, and so we get the hyperplane that looks like this in R3 that slices through the two classes. If we then come back to R2 and look at what does this, uh, and want to see what does this look like, we get something like this. So this picture is it, almost as if you're standing outside this plot and looking down from this direction. You get this sort of a decision boundary. So it's obviously not a linear decision boundary. We declare everything inside the circle to be class, the red class, everything outside it to be the blue class. But we got this decision boundary using a linear classifier in a higher dimensional map space. To introduce some notation, to give a, a, some intuitions, uh, one in, in for regression, another for classification, you probably already thought by now. Um, so it's nice that I know the answer, I know the mapping in those two cases. I'm looking at the data, I generated the data, so I know what the, uh, 
mapping should be. So in my problem, however, which expansion should I use? What should I define this phi uh, function of my inputs x to be to map it to a higher dimension? So in, in reality, that's not an obvious there's, that's, there's not an obvious answer to that question. Um, the illustrations I showed required knowledge about the data that we're probably not going to have in practice, especially if the data is higher in higher dimensions than uh, two or three dimensions. So one quick approach um, that could be tried is to use what, what we could call the kitchen sink. So we, we simply come up with every possible feature expansion that we can think of, we take our original data in RD and we map it to as high a dimensional space as we can possibly come up with where each dimension is just some arbitrarily picked function of the data. We don't know if it's a good function or a bad function, um, but we have a lot of these functions. And then we put an L1 penalty on the weights in that space for the classifier or the regression model. So we if we take our uh, data point xi and map it into a very high dimensional space using every function of it that we can think of, all the polynomials, all the you know, logarithms, the, all the indicators, et cetera, et cetera, for, each, for whatever dimensionality that higher dimensional space is, we're now going to have to learn a uh, weight vector on each of those dimensions w. So we've seen with regression that when we do an L1 penalty on w, that's like we're encouraging sparsity in the weights of W. And so if we define this so-called kitchen sink uh, uh, expansion, feature expansion, and then put a sparse prior on the weights, uh, we could imagine that we could then let the model decide which of the feature, uh, which of the functions that I chose are actually useful for my problem. So that's, that's one possible approach. However, uh, to motivate the rest of the lecture, um, for many models, it actually can be shown that we don't actually need to work in the feature space, in the expansion space, that all we ever need to work with are what are these dot products between our feature expansions. And so I'll make that clear in the following slides. So the, the key thing right now is to, to know that we define a dot product between uh, the feature expansion for two data points to be something that can be called a kernel. So we define this dot product to be a kernel function between xi and xj. And thinking about the problem this way uh, can lead to some interesting results. <laughs>